Hello, lords and ladies of the internet. I'm the King of Candor, and today I'm going to be talking about the history of oozes and slimes in fantasy. You all voted for this one. If you want to help vote for the next topic, subscribe and check the community section, or join our public Discord linked below. So, what are oozes and slimes? The term slime, jelly, ooze, and pudding are all interchangeable when talking about these creatures. D&D tries to differentiate them, and we'll talk about that later, but all of them are correct, and I'll be calling them oozes and slimes throughout the video. Some terms to help. Oozes are these blob-like creatures that are usually made of some sort of acidic substance. They absorb their foes and melt them down for sustenance. Often they are slow-moving, rolling or sliding into place. They were popularized by D&D and its offshoots, However, oozes are often confused with blob-like creatures. For example, Sandman in Spider-Man 3. He is not an ooze or a slime, since he has more intelligence and is better described as a formless item instead of slime-like. The same goes for the T-1000 from Terminator, since that is a robot, even though he's made of Capri Sun commercials. Grey Goo is special. This is more of a category of monster than a specific one. Grey Goos are those nanobot swarms or some other sci-fi tech that flies around and does things. Sometimes they dissolve structures, other times they attack the heroes while leaving everything else intact. Think of them as robotic locusts. They're definitely related to oozes and slimes and how they move and how they can seep into things, but they're more akin to swarms, which is a whole other type of monster I want to cover in videos one day. The last type of not a slime I want to mention is the thing from the movie The Thing. This creature is the closest to that of an ooze of all the ones I just mentioned, but I feel like it being a flesh monster moves it to a different category. It really isn't some slime cube and should be given a different categorization at that point. So oozes and slimes, are they a modern invention? You'll be surprised to learn that they're actually not. We have references to something called star jellies that go back to the 1400s. I've done loads of research on star jellies, but honestly, I feel like a conspiracy theorist afterwards. I'll give you all the most logical version I can, so buckle up. A star jelly is most likely one of three things. It's either unfertilized frog eggs that birds spat up, a type of fungus that somehow got airborne, or chemical byproducts. The issue with all these explanations is they don't explain why star jelly only appears during or after a meteor shower. Let's look at some of the historical star jellies and I'll try to explain how these categories work. The first official mention of star jelly is debated. Wikipedia has it called Stella Tarare in a medical textbook by John of Gadsden written between 1280 and 1361 but I could not find a copy of this to verify, and other websites I checked couldn't either. The first thing I can confirm as being real is from the Oxford English Dictionary, where it cites stare slime as a medical substance. They thought it could be used to treat tooth abscesses, which is funny. It pops up several times in medical textbooks, with many people noting, do not eat it. It is also noted as being found after rainfalls where stars have fallen, or by starfall events. The next star jelly report I want to talk about is a poem from Sir John Suckling, who invented the game of cribbage. It's written in 1641, and his poem goes like this. As he whose quicker eye doth trace, a false star shot to mark the place. Dews run apace. And yet, thinking it's to catch, a jelly do up to snatch. Here, he compares finding his love to finding some star jelly. Which is really weird, because many other stories talk about star jelly being disgusting and foul-smelling. That's not how I would describe my beloved, is all I'm saying. From here, it pops up many times in the English-speaking world, from Wales to Scotland to the United States and even Australia. 
All of these predate modern medical technology, and besides star jelly, some scientists thought it could be frog eggs, pixie puke, or deer semen. One interesting case is in Veracruz, Mexico, there's a slime that grows called caca de luna, which means moon poop. That was too funny to not include. So, star jellies continue to fall and confuse people for hundreds of years until we get better testing technology. Unfortunately, there seems to be some conspiracy to stop these tests from being done right, but let's cover three verifiable cases. The first was on the 19th of September in 2009 in the Scottish Hills, where hundreds of people reported finding the stuff. A radio show had it analyzed, and they discovered it was a type of fungus that was swept up in a windstorm. Okay. So the second, though, was done by BBC Nature program Nature's Weirdest Events, Series 4, Episode 3, which aired the 14th of January, 2015. They got some star jelly and had its DNA tested. This confirmed it was unfertilized frog eggs, but there was also some magpie DNA in it, which they concluded it was a bird vomiting up the eggs and not a frog-bird hybrid, much to my disappointment. The most recent, though, was in 2019 in Goochland County, Virginia, the United States. These samples were collected quickly and tested by experts only to find out it was not a living substance, but a chemical used as a replacement for gardening soil that somehow clumped together and worked its way to the surface. That's the weirdest one to me. None of these explain why star jelly is found after meteor showers outside of it being an unrelated coincidence. So I guess let's look at fantasy and see if we can find more logic there. The earliest fantasy slime creature I could find is from Ooze by Anthony M. Rudd in 1923. This story is actually free and I linked it below if you want to read it. It's a fun horror short story about a man who's searching for his dead friend and his dead friend's wife. Warning, the book was written in 1923 so some of the language is uh, a bit rough. Now the story's super cool and as far as I could tell, it's the first one that ooze or slime was ever written about as a monster. The way it absorbs its victims and how it uses its pseudopods to pull them in, how it feeds and grows bigger as it eats, its mostly clear form, and even some of the rotting smells associated with it all become staples of the future monster. Now, H.P. Lovecraft has two things which can be thought of as oozes or slimes as well. The first is in The Color Out of Space from 1927. This is a short story about a meteor that falls to a town and secretes some strange substance which infects the crops and life in town. This is definitely a reference to the star jellies from history and their mysterious properties. I know it. Lovecraft also mentions Shoggoths. These strange formless monsters with many eyes that crush their prey and absorb them for sustenance. They are first mentioned in his sonnets, Fungi from Yagoth, but are also expanded upon and given more solid features in the work At the Mountains of Madness from 1931. Adjacent to Lovecraft are the Dopots from Stanley G. Wenabom's Parasite Planet. This story came out around the same time as Lovecraft's in 1935, but due to publication issues, it was actually released first. These creatures act way more like the traditional slimes, absorbing their prey and everything around them. They are the apex hunters of Venus and a really neat thing. I could totally see that this is a hidden inspiration for all future slime monsters. From here, we're going to go back to historical slimes and oozes for a moment. We need to talk about the Philly slime. On screen are the two panels from the Philadelphia Inquirer, dated September 27th, 1950. This covers an incident where two officers, John Collins and Joseph Keenan, were on patrol in South Philadelphia. They saw what looked like an object parachuting down that they said was six feet in diameter. It landed in a field near 26th Street. 
They immediately called for backup, and Joseph Cook and James Casper responded. All four of them then went to investigate. They said the object gave off a strange purplish glow with a misty quality. The mist almost appeared to have crystals floating inside it. Officer John Collins decided to pick up the object. When he did, part of it broke off as he raised his hand and it evaporated, leaving behind a sticky, odorless residue. While they discussed what to do for the next 25 minutes, the object completely dissolved. And then when they investigated the area, they found that wherever the ooze had landed, it had been so light it didn't disturb the weeds. After much deliberation, they called the FBI. You see, some of the officers were kind of embarrassed since they had no proof, but the FBI came anyway and seemed interested in it. Nothing came out of this event officially, however, News of the story caught the eye of Irving H. Milgate, who would remember it for years later. In 1957, film producer Jack H. Harris wanted to make a new monster movie and needed a good monster. He sat with his friend Irving H. Milgate and began to brainstorm. Jack is quoted as saying, It's got to be in color instead of black and white. And it can't be a cheapy creepy. It's got to have some substance to it. It's got to have the characters you can believe in. It's got to be a unique monster, never done before, and the method of killing the monster would have to be something that Grandma could have cooked up on her stove. And then, Irving remembered the story of the Philadelphia police, and The Blob was born. The Blob is a classic sci-fi horror film. In fact, I found it for free on YouTube. It's linked below if you want to go watch it, and before you go, make sure you give the video a like and subscribe. So, those of you who didn't leave, let me give you a summary of the film. The Blob takes place in a couple of small towns in Pennsylvania. Side note, I keep seeing people online call this the Midwest. Those people are dumb and you should throw bricks at them. So, two teenage lovers are kissing at Lover's Lane when they see a meteorite crash nearby. They go to investigate, but a nearby old man gets there first. The old man is attacked by the Blob and the teenagers bring him to the doctor. Dr. Wisely leaves the man with the blob eating him in another room and orders the teens to go get the meteor in case it'll help. While they talk, the blob eats the old man and a nurse, growing larger and redder as it does. It then attacks the doctor as the teens return to see him being eaten. The teens then go to the police, who don't believe them. Later, the teens sneak out again and the blob goes around town eating several people. The teens gather a group of people to attack the blob, which corners them in one of the teens' father's grocery store. They hide in the freezer and the blob can't get to them. The teens then set off the air raid alarms, which get all the adults to come out and demean the kids for pulling a prank, until the blob starts eating people in a nearby theater. They all hide in the diner, which the blob is so big it totally absorbs. The cops then try to electrocute the blob, which doesn't work, that sets the diner on fire. The owner of the diner uses his fire extinguisher, which makes the blob retreat. The teens then remember the blob hated the cold in the freezer, and the town attacks it with their fire extinguishers, freezing the blob until the military takes it to the Arctic, where the blob will remain, quote, as long as the Arctic stays cold, and we see the end. However, it morphs into a question mark. How spooky. You can see many of the blob's features here. It's growing when eating people, how it's slow when it moves, it's weakness to cold, and many more things future games would adopt. An interesting side note on the blob and its origins, I've also seen it said that the blob was inspired by the Great Fear Flood of 1814 in London and the Great Molasses Flood in 1919. In both situations, Large vats containing their respective liquids burst and swept across the land. The 1814 beer flood killed 8 people, and the Great Molasses Flood of 1919 killed 21. These have never been confirmed as inspirations for the blob, but a lot of the imagery lines up. Based on the dates of these floods, I would wager we'll see a great Coca-Cola flood in 2024, so be ready. It's also no secret that Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson the creators of D&D, were heavily inspired by Conan the Barbarian when they worked on it. Knowing this, we can see a potential inspiration 
for the oozes and slimes in the Conan story, The Curse of the Monolith, originally printed as Conan and the Sentataph. This story sees Conan in between his mainline adventures, delivering a letter of friendship between two kingdoms. He is lured by his guide to a giant metal monolith, which is magnetic, and causes Conan to become stuck to it. His guide then summons a giant amoeba, which slowly crawls down to digest Conan. He quickly cuts the straps of his armor, knocks out the traitor, and feeds him to the amoeba. Conan then sets fire to it and kills the monster. This feels exactly like a random encounter in D&D, and I'm willing to bet it's stuck in the back of the mind of Dane Arneson, since he specifically recalls reading some of these Conan in between stories. So where do slimes in D&D come from? I personally think we might have two origins for them. The first was Gary Gygax. Gary was obsessed with something called Gygaxian naturalism. Basically, he wanted everything to make sense in the world. Monsters who hate each other shouldn't live near each other, and they need rooms to sleep in and restrooms and things like that. Knowing this, dungeons would naturally get filthy over time, and I would bet they would get worse when you remember things like goblins live in them. Gary wanted to make sort of a clean-up monster, and invented things like the ochre jelly, the gelatinous cube, the carrion crawler, and many others like it. Gary himself said these creatures were inspired by nature, but I think Gary took monsters from memory and repurposed them for his cleaners. In fact, Gary specifically said Dave Arneson came up with black puddings as a monster, and he adopted that concept. A fun fact on this specifically, Gary said Dave Arneson is the one who named the black pudding because he absolutely hated the English dish so much. This is an actual blog post from Gary himself, by the way. It's nice to see how connected the hobby was. He still was, even as late as 2006. So this is my theory for the second origin. Dave Arneson hated English food. He wanted to use a beast from Conan that he read, and then Gary melded them into his cleaners. So the artists were probably told to envision things like the blob, and as more designers began to work on it, these inspirations became more solid. Looking at the history of D&D, we can see many changes and developments of slimes and oozes. They start simple with an amoeba-like appearance, slowly sliding towards their foes to dissolve them. This is also where the gelatinous cube is first seen. Like I mentioned above, Gary wanted a waste disposal monster to live in dungeons. What I find interesting is how this evolved from a waste destroyer into a meta enemy for players. You see, the gelatinous cube had a fun feature of being exactly big enough to take up a hallway. This was originally to help it clean better, but it evolved to make them the best player stopper. No one wanted to risk being melted by these things, and it was always blocking the way. However, it moved slow enough that many players would try to move around it, going in a different direction in the dungeon. Sometimes this would work, and sometimes you get trapped and die. As D&D evolved over the years, many slimes and oozes developed. I want to go through a few of them and their changes here real quick. Starting with slimes. They are the most immobile and simply drop on top of unsuspecting heroes. They're more of a hazard than a true monster and are the weakest of the group. Next are the jellies. Jellies can move and attack using their pseudopods to do so. The most famous is the ochre jelly, which is the one that's most like the blob. It's a massive jelly which can slide into cracks as small as one inch squared. It just sort of rolls around on the ground of a dungeon until it finds some prey, which it engulfs and digests. Mustard jellies are an intelligent variant of the ochre jelly. They are smarter, acting more as ambush predators, and using a slowing gas to weaken their victim before pursuing them. What's really neat about them is they're fully intelligent, and apparently this comes from them being made when a wizard attempted to polymorph herself into an ochre jelly and failed. There are also jellies from other planes like shadow jellies, but they all feel the same as the ochre jelly, just with a little elemental or extra planner flavor. Oozes are almost exactly like jellies, and the two categories have been merged in modern games. Most oozes absorb their foes and have an elemental tinge to flavor them. However, the most iconic ooze is non-elemental. 
Here it is, the gelatinous cube. I know we've all been waiting for him. He's super iconic to D&D. His ability is to basically be invisible to unsuspecting foes. The acid to dissolve things that walk into him, his cube shape, it's perfectly evolved for dungeons. What is there to love about this guy? I know other oozes are popular, but the gelatinous cube is my favorite. He's a perfect monster concept done simple and done right. Now the puddings. The puddings all function similar as the slimes to being ambush predators, usually falling from the ceiling onto their victims. Unlike slimes though, the puddings can move and attack. They reach out with their pseudopods to grab things. Puddings also are noted as being the only things that can be damaged and split in combat, and black puddings are the most common, with white puddings being snow variants, and done puddings being swamp variants. There are puddings for all the environments. But I want to mention something called a marble pudding from Dragon Magazine 251. These puddings are sticky instead of acidic, and they're all white. And the monster's noted as possibly being a genetic link between puddings and mimics, which is really neat actually. I would be remiss if I didn't mention the Oblex. The Oblex is the result of a child, Nolan Whale, working with the D&D design team and the Make-A-Wish Foundation to add a monster to the game. He designed one of the absolute coolest oozes ever invented, the Oblex. This is an ooze that was altered by Mind Flayers, I'll cover them one day, don't worry, to be more intelligent and craving memories. These Oblexes trap a victim inside of them draining their memories and personality while killing them. This isn't the end of the evil though, because anyone drained by an oblex is added to its consciousness, and it allows the oblex to make a false ooze form of them. Since the oblexes have all the memories of their victims, they can use them to lure more prey to them. They can make these copies move far away from them, and the only thing connecting the host is an oozy umbilical cord that stretches back to the main body absolutely wild creatures. The final ooze is the Plasmoids. These are a race made playable for 5th edition, and they're pretty neat. Your body is amorphous, allowing you to reshape it and slide into cracks as small as 1 inch. Your items don't come with, but sadly that's about it. They also get dark vision, Pfft, who does it in 5th edition, and some poison and acid resistances. What's strange is you can get a pseudopod, the iconic ooze attack form, but it can't attack, and you can't deal acid damage or even absorb someone. Which is strange because those are core features of the base monster. This bothers me enough that I made a note to eventually remake this race as something more fun for my own game of Enos and release it for free online. Now, before we continue, if you enjoyed the content, don't forget to like and subscribe. So, moving into gaming. In the video game Wizardry, players encounter slimes as an enemy type very early on. They're not very special, but they're clearly based on Dungeons and Dragons and are cousins to it, so they're very weak and easy to kill. They do, however, influence the designers of the Dragon Quest RPG to add slimes to their setting. However, when they originally designed slimes, they wanted them to be like the monsters from Western RPGs. But Akira Toriyama, yes, the same guy who made Dragon Ball, was the character designer and he didn't like that. Instead, he made them these little teardrop shaped cute guys you see on screen. Look at the little eyeballs and smiles. Aren't they adorable? Now, this was actually a revolutionary act. By making them cute, it gave slimes a bit of a personality makeover. Instead of being seen as the horrific monsters that you should kill quickly, they kind of became lovable goofballs and sacks of free XP. In fact, in a lot of Japanese media, it's a trope to simply kill slimes to level up quickly. It is through this that we get the trend of cute slimes and adding personalities to them. This will have dire consequences later. So, before we go, I want to cover some modern slimes and ooze adjacent monsters. This won't be a comprehensive list, and I encourage you to share your favorites below. 
This list covers a wide variety of oozes and slimes to show how they've evolved or other theories behind them. Boo from DBZ. Majin Boo from Dragon Ball Z is a funny one to consider. He does have many of the qualities of oozes and is sentient. Unlike some of the other slime creatures, I think Boo fits as an ooze since he sort of absorbs things and can change his form. Plus, Akira Toriyama wrote Dragon Ball and worked as the character designer for the slimes in Dragon Quest. Adventure Time Slime Princess and the Slime Kingdom from Adventure Time are all clearly oozes. Adventure Time is interesting because it feels like a little kid's understanding of D&D at times, which carries over to Slime Princess and her kingdom. I think this is the only modern western fantasy to have oozes that doesn't already stem from an existing fantasy property, which is pretty neat. Pokemon Pokemon has slime and ooze Pokemon like Muck and Ditto. They don't quite fit the ooze we're talking about, they're just blobs and as far as I can tell they don't melt people and absorb their food, but I was told that I should include them. Minecraft Slimes Minecraft also has added slimes to its setting. They don't do acid damage, but they do damage by bumping into you, and when killed, they split into smaller slimes a few times. They then drop the slime, which is like glue. It's very neat to have them use as glue, I don't see that many elsewhere. Bob from Monsters vs. Aliens Bob is definitely a slime. He's obviously based on The Blob from the film with the same name, but he takes a little bit of the silliness that Eastern Media Slimes has. He moves like a slime, he melts things inside of him, and he doesn't need to breathe like slimes. <sighs> now, I would be remiss if I didn't at least touch the concept of slime girls. They are mostly an eastern design, with the idea that the girl is made from slime and can shape herself in any sexy manner required. What's actually really interesting about slime girls is how they were created. From what I read using Japanese blogs, it seems to come from manga inspired by the Blob and Shoggoths from Lovecraft. They then lost their prominence in culture until D&D reintroduced slime creatures. Then Dragon Crest made them friendly. Shortly thereafter, things like Terminator 2 made the idea of liquid humans popular, and then they got mixed with the old slime lore. Now we have modern slime girls. Remember when I said slimes being friendly would have dire consequences? Here are your consequences. As I was wrapping up this video, a friend of mine asked about Flubber from the Robin Williams film in 1997. Now, that film is actually a remake of a film in 1961 called The Absent Minded Professor, which itself is an adaptation of a short story from 1943 called A Situation of Gravity by Samuel W. Taylor. Knowing all this, I would say Flubber is not related to slimes or oozes. It doesn't really absorb and attack anything, it's also far from acidic. I do think it's a very neat concept, and I can see some future projects doing something with this, but it's not for me. My slimes and oozes are going to be more traditional. In Enos, I have some lore about how they are created as a result of failed summoning experiments. Basically, if you do not do the ritual correct, the creature is ripped apart and this thing comes out. They can be cut into smaller parts as well as absorbed into other ones to grow bigger. Elemental ones are made when summoning creatures with those of elemental power, otherwise the default acidic one comes out. They're considered a major threat since they can terrorize nature and grow to heights unimaginable if left alone for too long. Thankfully they are usually weak when summoned, or the room they are summoned in is covered in stone which they can't digest. I also plan to use the different types of slimes, the puddings, the oozes, and give them all their own unique flavor. I haven't quite worked everything out yet, so if you have any ideas, I'd love to hear them in the comments below. That is all for today. Thank you for watching this far. If you enjoyed the content, I'd appreciate it if you liked and subscribed. I'm looking forward to your candor in the comments below, and have a great day. Side note, I really hope you come join the Discord. We spent a uh, few weeks soft launching it to test it, and I think it'll be super fun. I also couldn't find a spot to mention the slimes from Castle Crossers, other than them being super annoying to kill on insane mode, they're just normal slimes. Have a good day guys.